Let's talk about SGLT2 inhibitors and how they work, plus some pharmacology. Here's everything we'll talk about, timestamps down below, and a short quiz at the end. To truly understand how these SGLT2 inhibitors work, we need to do a quick overview. We'll start with talking about the three most common SGLT2 inhibitors you might come across. We have canagliflozin, dipagliflozin, and empagliflozin. We'll talk about these more in detail later. These are the most common, but there are others on the market. You also have to know these medications are typically used to treat type 2 diabetes. We'll talk about this in more detail, but that's the primary function of these medications. And the goal of treating type 2 diabetes is to lower blood glucose in this patient population. The other thing is anytime we talk about diabetes medication management, we need to know which medications are oral and which medications are injectable. These SGLT2 inhibitors, they are oral medications. And the last thing, as you probably noticed, all of these SGLT2 inhibitors, they end in liflozin. So that's a good way to remember the pharmacology side of these medications. Now that we have a general understanding, how do these SGLT2 inhibitors actually work? Well, we have to look at the kidney to see the mechanism of action. So in your kidney, we know it filters a lot of waste, a lot of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, calcium. It can also filter out glucose. So the point of your kidney is to filter out these products. So if we zoom in to the kidney, we can see the proximal renal tubules. So this is just a zoomed in portion of the kidney that filters out blood. So here, we're going to follow glucose. So we see glucose right here in the glomerular filtration, and it's going to go down these tubules and eventually into our urine. But your body is very smart. Just because it's filtered out doesn't mean the glucose makes it to the urine. Your body is going to constantly try to reabsorb items, products, electrolytes. Your body is going to absorb things that they really think they need. So in this case, we see glucose traveling down the proximal renal tubule, which is important. And eventually, it could do one of two things. It could either A, get reabsorbed, or B, filter directly into the urine. So let's discuss the first option, A. So when we have glucose going down our tubules in our kidney, it could get reabsorbed. What does that mean? That means this glucose molecule that got filtered gets caught right up here in the proximal renal tubule, and your body actually is going to reabsorb that glucose out of the filtration process, meaning your kidneys were doing its job. It was filtering out the glucose, but then your body says, wait, 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 we want that glucose. So that glucose gets filtered out and goes back into your bloodstream. So what ends up happening, you get an increase of blood glucose levels. And that makes sense, right? The glucose is going back into your bloodstream and it's getting filtered out through a channel called the SGLT2. So the SGLT2 is what causes the glucose to go back into the bloodstream. So now let's look at option two. If it doesn't get reabsorbed, then it'll be fully filtered into your urine. And here, it's very straightforward. Again, we have glucose. It goes entirely through the proximal renal tubule. It goes through. This is called the loop of Henle. And it finally filters all the way to your urine. And once it's in your urine, you get to pee it out. And that is when it's truly filtered and wasted. So if that glucose is now in your urine, that means that glucose is not in your bloodstream. So overall, we have this lowering of glucose effect. This happens to every patient. Every healthy patient with kidneys is going to either filter out and reabsorb glucose depending on your glucose level. So if you take a healthy patient, and this is important, if they have 180 milligrams of glucose in their blood, the kidney will automatically excrete that glucose directly to the urine. 
So if they have a lot of glucose, which is 180 or more, into the blood concentration, your body knows to not reabsorb the glucose. Your body knows to let that glucose travel all the way to the urine so you can excrete it out. This is where SGLT2 inhibitors come into play. Let's say a patient takes canagliflozin, and remember, it's an SGLT2 inhibitor. So what does it do? It blocks that reabsorption of glucose at the proximal renal tubule. So it's going to block the SGLT2 transporter. It's going to stop reabsorption of glucose. So it will force the glucose to go all the way to the urine to be excreted. What's interesting is when a patient takes these medications, instead of that 180 milligram glucose concentration that we said normal patients have, it drops the threshold to 70 to 90 milligrams. So if a patient's taking this medication, it lowers the threshold of how much glucose the body wants in the urine, meaning they get to excrete the glucose more and more. And that's what we want. We want our patients that are diabetic to excrete this glucose. They have too much glucose already. We need them to excrete the glucose, decrease their serum concentration so that we could manage their diabetes better. And this is specifically for our type 2 diabetic patients. Now that we understand how these SGLT2 inhibitors work, let's talk about when we actually use them. And we just discussed this. You use them in type 2 diabetic patients. You do not use them in type 1. You only use them in type 2. The reason is because type 2 diabetic patients have an issue with insulin resistance. So you need to help the glucose concentration go down. Type 1 diabetic patients, it's a different pathology. Type 1 diabetic patients, they can't produce insulin. So this would not help them. These medications are not first line for type 2 diabetes. The first line medication is reserved for metformin. And these are more used as an add-on, an adjunct therapy on top of metformin. 90% of the time, you're going to use these medications for diabetes. But there are a couple medications in this class that you could use for other indications. You have chronic kidney disease. So these are patients that have their kidney function being poor or they're regressing. It's getting worse. And you also have patients that have heart failure. So their heart isn't pumping blood correctly. And both of these instances are only for specific SGLT2 inhibitors. Both of these can be also treated with the pagliflozin and empagliflozin. These two work for these indications, and then they all work for type 2 diabetes. Now that we know when to use these medications, let's talk about the dosing. So all these SGLT2 inhibitors, it's once a day. So canagliflozin, brand name Invokana, is anywhere from 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams by mouth daily. We have the pagliflozin, which is Farziga. It's anywhere from 5 to 10 milligrams by mouth daily. And then we have our empagliflozin, our Jardiance, anywhere from 10 to 25 milligrams daily. And one thing to really know is you want to recommend taking this medication in the morning before breakfast. That's the key. Remember, anytime a patient eats food, that's when your glucose is going to increase in your bloodstream. So you want to take this medication before you eat early in the morning so that it can capture all the meals you eat throughout the day. Let's talk about the side effects that we see with SGLT2 inhibitors. The first one is we see weight loss in our patients that start this medication, which is a great thing. Typically, type 2 diabetic patients are overweight. So you'll see anywhere from, let's say, 5 to 7 pounds of weight loss. The next thing is to look out for is the hyperkalemia that it might cause. Because these medications work on the kidney, it can alter the concentration that's being absorbed and reabsorbed, and you'll have an increase in potassium into your blood. And that can get dangerous, but it's something to note and monitor. The next thing we can see is dehydration. And that makes sense. Because these medications make you urinate glucose, water is going to follow. So it's going to make the patient urinate out more 
water, and that's going to lead to some dehydration. The last side effect I want to touch on is a unique one. These medications can cause jetinourinary infections, basically fungal infections or bacterial infections, because you're peeing out more and more glucose, which is sugar, you have that chance of causing a fungal infection or a bacterial infection because these microbes love sugar. And we see it more in women than we see in men. So about 10% in women, 3% in men. All right, we made it to the end. Let's do a quick summary to see what we learned. We talked about SGLT2 inhibitors. We said how they're only used for type 2 diabetics. They're not used in type 1 diabetics. We said they're oral dosage forms because we take it by mouth. We also talked about how they work at the kidney level, at the proximal tubules, which allow the glucose to stay in the urine. Because remember, it blocks the glucose from being reabsorbed into the blood. So you keep more glucose in the urine. We also said that they work in type 2 diabetes, but you have a couple that can work for chronic kidney disease and then also heart failure being dipagliflozin and empagliflozin. We also went through all three of these in detail, the canagliflozin, dipagliflozin, and pagliflozin. We talked about the brand. We talked about the dosing. And the whole goal of these medications is to decrease your blood glucose level. And then we talked about some side effects. We talked about that weight loss side effect, that potassium increasing in your bloodstream or hyperkalemia side effect. We talked about dehydration and then that genitourinary infection side effect. Okay, so that's everything. Let's do a short quiz to see what we retained. Question one, all SGLT2 inhibitors end in which suffix? Question two, what is the MOA of canagliflozin? Question three, which indication is canagliflozin used for? Question four, which side effect is unique to SGLT2 inhibitors?